Okay, good morning. Um, so I have a small complement of the course of yesterday because uh, uh, I had no time to finish the lecture, so I will finish some part and then I start uh, the proper course of today. Um, just uh, from behalf of everybody of us, uh, we will send you our uh, uh, presentation, but please, uh, this, is, this, this is a personal work, so don't diffuse and don't use uh, like that. Just uh, if you want, you take some notes and you do your own presentation because it's a personal uh, document. Okay, uh, but I have sunglasses, I don't see anything, sorry. <laughs> Okay, so, so as you certainly remember, yesterday I, I showed this theorem of existence, uniqueness, and a priori estimates for the Dirichlet problem. Now the question is, uh, okay, why this solves the Dirichlet problem? I mean the boundary condition. Uh, and um, in general, what we can say about the boundary condition when you use a weak uh, solution? Indeed, the weak solution are in H1, and the function in H1, except for n uh, in one dimension, they are not continuous. And so, what is the meaning that we can uh, give to the restriction to the boundary? And uh, uh, why this is like that? Because the function in L2 are defined not in every point, but almost everywhere, as uh, measure theory teaches. So. Uh, we give here the notion of trace, which give a meaning to the restriction of function in W1P to the boundary, where, when the boundary is uh, Lipschitz continuous. And uh, when, uh, this makes sense because when the boundary is uh, Lipschitz, for instance, a, a, poly, a, poly, a polygon, uh, one still can define a normal integral on the boundary and the LP of uh, the boundary. So the trace theorem says simply that the, the restriction uh, operator, which is uh, uh, defined on continuous function, can be extended to H1 function. And then uh, that means that we can have, uh, oops, we can define a unique linear continuous application from H1 to L2, such that when the function is continuous till the boundary, uh, this gamma of U is simply the restriction of the function. This function is called the trace of U on the boundary, and we can assume that this is our weak meaning of uh, uh, the value of a function of, on the boundary. Uh, okay, so, and for Dirichlet, we have this characterization, which is interesting. We say that the function of H10 that we introduced yesterday are nothing else than the H1 function, which have uh, zero trace on the boundary. That means uh, that uh, we give a meaning to the Dirichlet condition for function in H1, 0, saying simply that they are, uh, uh, I mean, the fact that they are in H1, 0 means in particular that they satisfy the Dirichlet boundary condition. Now, uh, now I want to talk a little bit about the periodic function and the periodic uh, problem that everybody are speaking uh, about. So uh, we take the reference cell as uh, Edith did yesterday and we define, sorry, we define the H1 per set like the closure of C infinity function which are periodic on the boundary in the H1 norm. And then uh, it's easy to see that the function in H1 pair has the same trace on the opposite face of Y. And then uh, if we define almost everywhere the extension to Rn, this is a function which is still in H1 on any open set of Rn. Okay, so, so uh, in particular we will use the subspace of the H1 periodic function which has a zero mean 
on the, on the cell, uh, on the reference cell. And then one can show that for in W pair, uh, we have an inequality which looks like the Poincare inequality. Uh, that means that we can estimate the value of, uh, oh, excuse me, the year. Yeah, we can estimate the function by the gradient, and then we can show that the gradient is an equivalent norm to the norm uh, of W pair, which usually should contain also the function. Then, uh, let us introduce this class of problem. Uh, uh, take A in M alpha beta Y like yesterday, uh, H in L2, and uh, take a, a second member here, a data of the form of minus divergence of H. It can be more general, but for our aim is fine. U, Y periodic, and the average of U on Y equals zero. Then you, you start to look that uh, it's uh, something to do with the, the, our key and W that she introduced yesterday. So uh, the variational formulation is find the uh, W with the W, uh, U, U, which is W periodic, uh, such that we have this inequality for every test in uh, W pair. Now, OK. Actually, uh, since only the gradient arises, we can also uh, say that this is valid for H1 function, because if we remove the average is a constant, so it doesn't make any difference. OK, so we have a general theorem always with the Lux Milgram. Uh, we say that uh, the problem has a unique solution, and we have this a priori estimate. Um, Actually, this is not so obvious because uh, uh, we cannot uh, uh, straightforward apply Lux Milgram theorem. We have to work on uh, the quotient set of the function, uh, quotient with the constant, and then work on uh, equivalence class. But uh, finally, at the end, we solve that problem. So it's a little bit more tricky and more technical, but if you are not interested in uh, details, you can just keep that we have existence and uniqueness. And, uh, another pr and uh, we have also this property, which is not so obvious also, which uh, lie on the previous property of extension, that if, if you extend the solution to Rn, then uh, U is the unique solution of this problem. Uh, yes. So, uh, OK. <laughs> this is U and this is uh, V. This is V. OK, this is V. Sorry, I make a Or take this uh, U and this V. OK, I write. <laughs> Actually, I will uh, make a correct. This is uh, A gradient U gradient V equal H gradient V. Uh, what else? But, OK. Phi, the same phi. OK, so by density, we can take phi in H10. And this is a very important result, because this is the equation which will be satisfied by our, uh, by our uh, correctors, actually, our test function in the, in the following. OK, so. Uh, as a particular case, let us take h equal a lambda, where uh, uh, lambda is a given vector in a Rn. Then for every a, we can consider this problem, which is the problem uh, used in homogenization. His variational formulation is that one. Here is correct. Uh, and uh, OK, for every test in h1 pair. Um, and uh, by linearity, this is in very interesting. I think that Edith may be already observed that by linearity you have that one. So key at lambda is a linear combination of the key, which is, uh, the n key related to the canonical basis. So actually, it's enough to know just those n 
uh, functions. And then in the following, uh, as uh, uh, already seen yesterday, uh, the function w at lambda equal uh, lambda uh, dot x minus k at lambda have an important role. Uh, have an important role. Okay. Then other uh, boundary condition can be uh, described, like Dirichlet-Neumann condition, Robin condition, and other situation. We can discuss uh, in, the, uh, in the afternoon. And when I will use this problem, I will uh, explain anyhow something about. OK, so this was the complement of yesterday. And now let us start with the second part, which is which is course one. So in this lecture, I will talk about the tartar method of oscillating test function and correctors. OK, so um, as uh, Nanda already mentioned, and maybe there are many methods in homogenization. There is the multi-scale, the tartar method, the two-scale, the unfolding, the block uh, uh, function method. Uh, OK. Now, um, although some methods now are more used than others, I think, uh, and this is why I prepared this lecture, that is very important to know also this method because you understand many things and this is a way also to enter deeply in, uh, in the homogenized matrix, how it is done and so on. So uh, I think it's interesting uh, to see that before passing to other um, methods. Okay, so uh, I will talk about the periodical model, some fact about a weak convergence, classical homogenization, it's proof by Tartar method, convergence of energy and correctors. Okay, so okay, so this is our model. We have, uh, uh, for instance, we have two materials, the yellow and the blue. We can have a more uh, uh, mixture uh, and uh, uh, we uh, the yellow part uh, are obtained by a change of scale y equal x over epsilon, and the reference cell is also obtained by the same scaling. Okay. So now we consider a open set bounded open set over ren, the reference cell, a sequence of number who goes to zero, and uh, a matrix A, we, a matrix field A, which now is a epsilon periodic and is in M alpha beta y. Okay, then we set A epsilon of x equal A of x over epsilon. And observe that by construction, A uh, epsilon has the same estimate as A. That means that A epsilon is also in M alpha beta, beta omega. And this is very important in following because any time that something do not depend really on the matrix A, but just on the E's bounds, alpha and beta, uh, that we can use the bounds even for every epsilon. So this is an important uh, remark for me. Uh, okay, now let us discuss the Tartar method. First, in the case uh, uh, discussed by the edit yesterday, then uh, in the afternoon I will discuss the method in perforated domain. Okay, so uh, I consider this method very elegant, is my personal opinion, uh, and it's based on the use of suitable test function. Mm, what is also interesting is that the idea of the suitable test function can be adapted also to other uh, situation, non-periodic or non-linear. Uh, so consider the case uh, of yesterday, minus divergence A epsilon gradient to epsilon equal F, Dirichlet condition. For simplicity, F is in L2 of omega. For people who know sobel space, F can be also in the dual of H10. OK, uh, now, as we have seen in the, in the picture, 
We cannot suppose A continuous, for instance, because uh, the material jump. So uh, again, uh, we have to use the variational framework of weak solution. And uh, um, OK, so existence uniqueness, I just proved yes, proved the stated yesterday. So we have a unique solution. We have a unique solution, U epsilon in H10, excuse me, okay, in H10, such that uh, we have this variational formulation and the estimate. And so, as you can see, since uh, in the theorem uh, we have uh, the constant C omega over alpha, alpha is the same for every epsilon, so we have a priori estimate which is uniform with respect to epsilon. OK, and this is essential in the homogenization process. OK, now uh, some fact about weak convergence, uh, although maybe I had it yesterday, I talked a little bit. No, not, no. Oh, OK, so, OK, definition. So uh, I recall for those who have seen <laughs> that a sequence, uh, this is some functional analysis uh, background. Uh, we are, if we have a sequence in a Banach space, we say that it converges to A and we use uh, the half uh, arrow. If uh, the bracket x prime xn, uh, the duality bracket, converges to x prime x for every x prime in a prime. So, uh, so here is not, uh, is not, uh, okay, the convergence is based on the choice of x prime. Now, uh, this is an abstract definition, but uh, more uh, easily, if we have a space in L, uh, uh, the space LP, uh, think to P equal 2, then P prime is 2, then uh, the, the weak convergence can be written like Fn weakly converges to F if the integral of Fng converges to the integral of Fg. So, um, okay, so this is already a lot better because it's a convergence of integral, and as far as we can treat on integral instead of uh, duality, is a lot better because on integral we can use many theorem. On duality, we can just uh, we have just one estimate so that is. So uh, we have this. Uh, Theorem which say that if A epsilon is A of X over epsilon, A epsilon converges to its average. Okay, this theorem was quite long, uh, long to prove. In uh, my first book was a chapter. Actually now, as uh, Daniel probably will show, uh, you can do in two lines using unfolding. So, uh, okay. Now, um, let us remark that this convergence is never strong, except if it is constant. For instance, let us take the sin, sinus uh, y and uh, an equals sinus uh, sinus uh, nx, then uh, an converges to its average, which is uh, equal to zero weekly, but it's easy to see that it does converge to zero in uh, LP. OK. OK, so as a consequence, we have seen A epsilon converge to the, to the average. And this part is already done by edit. We know that the average does not describe the macroscopic behavior correctly. Uh, and so we have to uh, introduce the homogenized matrix called also effective matrix. And this matrix, so is not uh, so this is the feature. The, the limit uh, problem contains a matrix, which is not the limit of the matrix, but is the matrix of the problem solved by the limit of the solution. I, I explain again. You have not that A epsilon converge to something, and then you have a minus divergence of something. No. This is not the case, but you have that u epsilon converges to some u, and u solves 
something which is minus divergence of A0 gradient 2 equal F, and then this A0 describe the behavior. Okay, this is not so easy to prove. Uh, why? Because uh, we... We have two important facts uh, about uh, weak convergence. The first one is uh, if uh, E is reflexive, which is the case of L2, uh, bounded sequence are weakly relatively compact. That means that from any bounded sequence I can extract a subsequence which is uh, weakly converging. And so, uh, in our case, we have that U0, U uh, there exists U0 in the subsequence such that U epsilon weakly converges to U0. Now, uh, so it's easy to see that that means that the gradient converges to the gradient weakly in L2. And also, actually, the convergence of U epsilon to U0 is strong in L2. Uh, this is due to a very difficult and important theorem, which is called the uh, relic theorem, who say that the, the inclusion of H10 into L2 is compact. Okay, uh, this is a really difficult theorem, very interesting. You can just keep in mind that weak convergence in H10 of omega uh, implies strong convergence in L2. Okay, the, another important uh, thing now is that if we have a, a bracket or an integral, if we are in LP, of two sequences, one which converges weakly and the other one which converges strongly in the dual, in the case of P equal 2, it's just L2, L2, then the, the bracket converges to the bracket. So that means we can pass to the limit in the product. Okay, this is very fine. The problem is that this is not true if the, the both convergence are weak. This is why, if, for instance, you take just the same function, you know that the average of the square is not the square of the average. And then uh, you, you have not this property. And as a consequence, we cannot pass to the limit in the product A epsilon gradient U epsilon uh, straightforward because this one goes to the is average weekly, this one goes weekly to that one, but the weekly uh, the limit is not the product of both limit. So so uh, we are looking for the limit problem. The variational formulation is uh, uh, find u epsilon in H10 such that we have that. By compactness, uh, there exists C0 in L2 such that we have that. So that we have the integral uh, let, uh, of C0 gradient v equal fv for every test. That means minus divergence of C0 equal f. Now, the main point, as uh, Edith told yesterday, is what is the relation between C0 and U0? So the Tartar method consists in proving that C0 is what we want it is, actually. Okay, um, let us look at the case n equal 1, and uh, we can do the proof which is uh, quite uh, short. So we take an interval. Uh, the proof is uh, done due to Spagnolo in 67, which is almost the beginning of the homogenization, actually, although he was doing that in a more abstract framework called the G-convergence. And uh, uh, so we consider this problem minus uh, uh, in one dimension, where A epsilon is of the form A of X over epsilon is a periodic function uh, such that A is bigger than alpha, smaller than beta, and F is a L2 function. So look what happens. Um, okay, we have already seen U epsilon goes to U0, the derivative goes to the derivative, and C0 uh, Converges weakly to Xi0. Uh, with Xi epsilon satisfies this equation. Since we have this equation, actually the derivative of Xi epsilon is also bounded because it's fixed. Huh? And then 
Xi epsilon is bounded in H1 and not only in L2. Uh, then by compactness, Xi epsilon converges to Xi zero strongly. Then by definition, the, the derivative of Xi epsilon is A epsilon times uh, the derivative of U epsilon. So we have this equality. And now we are well because this is strong, this is weak. This one go to the average over on, uh, of one over A. And then we obtain that the, der the derivative of u0 is equal to the average of 1 over alpha over xi0. xi0. Then re we replace xi0 and we obtain that uh, we have the limit equation where the limit coefficient is 1 over the average of 1 over a, which is not the average of a, obviously, uh, with the same condition. Okay. So we, okay, so we can think, okay, fine, it's very easy to do all that, just a simple computation. We will do the same in n variable and it should work. Actually, nothing works of these uh, arguments. Why? Because the main point was that one, that minus uh, deri uh, the derivative equal f in one dimension, divergence is equal to derivative. So if the divergence is fixed, the derivative is fixed. That means it's bounded. But, uh, but here, uh, if we have that the divergence is bounded, we cannot de derive that the any, any function is bounded because we have only the sum of the derivative which is bounded. And uh, OK. <laughs> Other remarks, I have already said that uh, we have that the limit is not the product of the limits. Here is well clear. And observe also that, that if we have layered the materials, that means materials that are done, you know, like that, with several uh, floor uh, of um, thickness epsilon, we can still uh, have some explicit uh, expression. But in the general case, nothing of, of that is true. This is why we have the results that I added uh, yesterday. So you know the answer now. C0 is equal to A0 gradient to 0. A0 is a constant positive definite and given by this average where uh, W at lambda is this function, key lambda is solution of these problems. Okay, uh, this is the variation of formulation. We have said all that. Uh, okay, the function key at j are also uh, called the correctors because they correct the convergence actually. Okay, so once one has identified the, the, the limit of C0, one has that U0 is the unique solution of this problem. And moreover, since this problem has unique solution, the whole sequence converges. OK, so this is, uh, I want just to point out this point because it is uh, very important. This is a classical uh, argument in homogenization. If you have, uh, uh, what you do, you never, prove directly that the sequence converges. You have a sequence, you have compactness, you extract some sequence, you extract some sequence, you don't care, you go on extracting. And finally, you get one subsequence and one function, limit function that verifies something like here. Now, if the limit is identified in a unique way, then you can prove that all the sequence converges because you can start from uh, any subsequence and do the same argument and uh, all the subsequence will go to the same point. Then that means that uh, we don't care uh, on extractive subsequence. Obviously, this argument is not true anymore for linear problem, non-linear problem when uh, you, know, you don't know that the limit is unique, which is uh, mainly the case. OK, so OK, you can treat a lot of uh, problem with these ideas. So the tartar methods uh, give the relation of xi0 and u0. On what is based this method? This method is based on the fact that we have two scales, 
epsilon and x over epsilon. And then by this change of scale, we pass from one to the other one. And the main feature actually is the use of the adjoint problem of the cell Y, which a priori has nothing to do with the problem uh, defined by A. Uh, so the method actually lies on an important remark done by Tartar, which is that the matrix A0 can be also defined by the periodic, using the periodic solutions related not to A0 like the Kiat lambda, but related to the transposed field uh, of A. And then this allows uh, to do the proof uh, choosing a suitable uh, test function. Uh, so this is the theorem. Let B0, the matrix defined by B0 lambda equal, the, uh, like before, the same, but instead of A, here we have A uh, transposed of A, and uh, we removed all the at because we, uh, key lambda is related to the transposed now, and W lambda is related to key lambda and not key at lambda. Okay, so, um, if A0 is the homogenized matrix defined previously, then actually A0 is nothing else than the transposed of this B0, which means that the transposed of A0 lambda is the average of the transposed. Okay, that means that A0 is the transposed of the average of the transposed. Okay. Uh, the proof... To the proof, we have to pro prove that uh, A0 is the transposed of B0. This means actually for the linear algebra that B0 lambda mu, mu has to be equal to A0 mu lambda for every lambda in mu, changing the order of lambda in mu. And then uh, observe that B0 lambda mu by definition is 1 over y, the in this integral, uh, the integral of the transposed the gradient of W lambda multiplied by mu because uh, it was the average of this quantity. But here uh, we replace the uh, uh, gradient of lambda by its value, uh, which is lambda minus gradient of key. And then uh, this one uh, is equal to the integral of... Uh, what happens? Uh, yeah. Ah, yes. We just uh, split uh, this in two terms. We have a transposed of A lambda mu that we can write like A mu lambda minus transposed of A uh, gradient W uh, key mu that we also use in the transposition. We write like A mu gradient of, w, uh, of key. Now we, we choose, so before uh, we choose V equal key lambda in the rational formulation of the problem satisfied by <coughs> key at mu. And then from here uh, we write that this one is equal to uh, 1 over Y. Um, so what we do? We start from here. This one is equal to this minus this. This one is this one. This one is equal to this one using the equation of key at mu. And then uh, this one is the same. And here we use again the transposition. And we have uh, TA gradient key lambda gradient key at. Now we, game, we, do the, we play the, the same game. Uh, but you uh, uh, for key lambda that and using a key at mu as a test function. So we interchange the role and choosing a key at mu in the variational formulation, we do <coughs> similar computation and we arrive to that point. Okay, so this is done. You can uh, write the details if you want. So <coughs> you keep using to that. 
And so uh, the following uh, corollary is interesting by himself. That means actually that uh, the, the homogenized matrix of A uh, transposed is the transposed of the homogenized. And in particular, then, if A is symmetric, the homogenized matrix keeps the symmetry. OK, now let us do the homogenization results. So uh, we, we periodize uh, the function W lambda, and uh, we multiply it by epsilon, and uh, we set W epsilon lambda equal epsilon W lambda x over epsilon. OK, uh, before we, we talk about uh, uh, periodized function, why are we put uh, epsilon in front? We put an epsilon because, uh, um, OK, as you know, when you do the gradient, uh, the derivative of x over epsilon, you have 1 over epsilon who came out. So if you want a sequence bounded in H1, you have to put 1 epsilon before or after. So we put from the beginning. Um, and then uh, this is nothing else. OK, here, if you replace x by epsilon, x over epsilon, you have lambda x minus epsilon, the key of x over epsilon. So this one is bounded in L2 uh, by epsilon. That means that this term goes to 0. Then w epsilon lambda is strongly convergent to lambda x. Also. By the derivation rule, the derivative of this is lambda minus uh, the derivative with respect to y of q lambda uh, computed in the point x over epsilon, since epsilon disappears with the derivative. OK, so actually, this is again a fixed function periodized. So this uh, gradient is bounded in L2. That means that W epsilon lambda is actually bounded in H1. And uh, so it converges weakly to something which is the same limit as the strong uh, uh, limit in L2. OK, now we. We introduce the vector, uh, we set eta epsilon lambda equal transposed of a lambda gradient w epsilon lambda. OK, this position is not necessary just to write shorter formulas. Then, by construction, uh, since this one is nothing else than the gradient of a uh, uh, transposed of A gradient W lambda computed in X over epsilon, uh, by always the same theorem, actually this quantity, is, uh, which is at epsilon lambda, is weakly converging to the transposed of A0 lambda, weakly in L2. OK. And moreover, we can do, uh, we have, uh, uh, we can extend this function by periodicity. We have the equation as we discussed it before. So by a change of scale, we have this equation, which is integral over omega of eta epsilon lambda gradient V equals zero for every test now in H10 of omega. OK, this uh, is a good exercise to do, you should do. Uh, anyhow, this is something to be done independently of the method. Yes? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Yeah, yeah, this is exactly what I showed before, that the, you can extend the solution and it holds in all Rn, the equation. Then you periodize this equation inside. You make a change of variable and you get this one. And this is a really key point. OK, so now this is the Tartar method. You take a given function phi in d of omega, so this is 0 on the boundary. Then we choose phi w epsilon lambda in the problem of u, and the phi u epsilon in the problem solved by eta epsilon lambda. OK, why we introduce this phi? Simply because u epsilon is 0 on the boundary, but uh, so is in H1 0. But w epsilon lambda, which is a periodic function, is not 0 on the boundary. So we need to multiply it by a function which guarantee that the product is 0 on the boundary in some sense, then is in H1 0. OK. Then 
then if uh, we say uh, we set xi epsilon equal that we can write uh, the two equation we subtract the two equation we have integral over omega xi epsilon gradient v w epsilon lambda plus uh, because we put excuse me uh, we put uh, uh, this as a test function so the we uh, since this is the test function we have to compute the gradient so we do, we do the product the gradient of uh, uh, gradient of phi w epsilon lambda is equal to gradient to w epsilon lambda gradient phi plus plus uh, uh, phi gradient w epsilon lambda okay same uh, for the other product. So uh, here we have two terms for each uh, equation. Uh, here we put gradient of phi pro multiplied by the function. Here the gradient of function by phi. And here the same things with the u epsilon equal f phi w j epsilon. OK, this j should be, sorry, lambda. OK, so, ay, ay, ay. so here we have the problem because xi epsilon converges weakly. Uh, gradient W epsilon converge weakly, so this is a bad term. And here, this converge weakly. No, here is good. This converges weakly, this converges weakly. So we have uh, a worse situation than before. Instead to have one term uh, where, we, where we are not able to pass to the limit, we have now two terms with the product weak, weak, where we are not able to the limits. OK, so what is the story? Hey, but the story is that actually, and this is the idea of the method, is that actually, thanks to the use of the transposed, uh, those terms are equal because the xi epsilon gradient of that is nothing else than epsilon gradient of epsilon gradient that. Then you exchange the order and you put the transposed. This one is eta. So actually, those two terms are the same. So the bad term just cancel. And uh, so the remaining terms are those one, and those are easy. Because uh, why they are easy? Because this converge uh, weak, this converge strongly. This is fixed. This converge uh, weak, this converge is strong. Here, this uh, just a strong convergence, and you now it's easy. So we pass to the limit, and we obtain this one. Huh? Just uh, the limit everywhere. Then. But now, uh, excuse me, we remember that uh, uh, xi zero gradient of phi lambda x can be written like gradient of phi lambda x in parentheses minus the other term of the derivation. And we know the equation of xi zero. Maybe I make a short computation. Actually, the integral over omega, xi zero, gradient phi, which multiply lambda dot x, is equal to xi zero, gradient of phi lambda x, minus xi zero, gradient uh, of lambda x, which is lambda, um, phi. OK. But this one now is zero because we know that minus the divergence of xi zero is zero. Then, then this term can be replaced by the other one. That means that here we have uh, uh, xi zero lambda phi equal uh, plus the other one equal zero. That means this one is equal to that one. And now, since this is a constant, we can enter in the in the, um, in the gradient and then integrate by parts. So finally, we get this one. And then xi zero lambda is equal to uh, the transposed of a zero lambda gradient to zero, which is nothing else than a zero gradient to zero lambda. So that xi zero is equal to a zero gradient to zero, because lambda is an arbitrary in Rn. Okay, uh, 
Okay, I have not time to, you know, show all the details. Uh, this afternoon I will not be here, but tomorrow afternoon I will be here all the afternoon. So if you have any question, we can discuss in details a uh, uh, question about what I have done. Okay, so this is the proof of the electricity that Edith already did yesterday. Uh, and A0 is the same uh, constant uh, as alpha. Uh, alpha is uh, a epsilon, so I skip a little bit here. I just want to to, to complete the proof uh, that I did uh, no time to do. Uh, if you because the, we had that one that uh, the sum of a zero six j was no. What's that? Uh, okay. Correct. The sum of that is smaller or, or equal than alpha. I am, uh, it's, yeah, alpha over y, uh, this integral. Now, where zeta is the sum of xi, y minus ki at. Now, uh, we deduce like uh, edit I did yesterday that the matrix is positive. But we want more, we want a positive infimum. Then we observe that, okay, first we have that one, which is positive. It's positive and not, uh, never zero, uh, because uh, if uh, for some C this is zero, then the gradient of zeta is zero. That means that zeta uh, equal uh, the sum of xi y minus ki uh, t is a constant, which is impossible because this is, uh, uh, periodic and this is uh, affine function. Okay, so we have that and to finish we observe that the function h zeta zeta equal that is continuous on the unit sphere. This is a classical argument. So this is continuous on the unit sphere. So the minimum is on the unit sphere and then is positive because the function is always positive. Then uh, on the unit sphere h zeta zeta is bigger than some alpha zero. Then by linearity, you have the desired uh, thing. Okay. Now, let us talk about the convergence of the energy. Is it okay? It's too quick? Okay. So uh, now um, this is related to the method also, and uh, so the Tartar method and Tartar in particular and Murat had the, the, um, this on the merit not only the Tartar for the method, but also for the notion of the correctors, which is a, a, an important point. Um, and is in the same spirit of the Tartar method uh, in this uh, framework. Uh, so first, let us discuss with the energy. Okay, this quantity is called the energy. Is called the energy, and uh, because physically is an energy. And uh, what we have is that the epsilon energy go to the limit energy. The proof here in this case is very simple because we have that from the variational formulation, this quantity is equal to the integral over omega f u epsilon the x, but u epsilon converges to u zero, so this quantity, the energy converges to that. But this one is just the right hand side of the limit problem, then this one is exactly, uh, then this one is a zero gradient to zero gradient to zero, so we have that this one converges to this one. Okay, so this is easy. Uh, okay, energy is not so easy in general. This is just a nice case, but when you have also or other configuration, the proof are not so quick. Okay, so now let us talk about correctors. Um, I will do the full proof uh, for correctors. Uh, people who are not used to make so much proof, don't worry. Uh, and uh, in the case of all, I just uh, uh, quote the results uh, without uh, proof because uh, they, it's quite long. Okay, so let us introduce the idea of correctors. From the homogenization results, 
We have that uh, gradient u epsilon converges weakly to gradient of u0. That means that the difference goes quickly to zero. Okay, we have seen that this convergence is not strong, and in some time the gradient is an important physical quantity, so we would like to approximate in a strong sense, not in a weak sense. And then uh, the idea is introduce something which is the so-called the corrector matrix, uh, which uh, improve this convergence, making it strong. But obviously, we cannot live like that. We have to adjust the term gradient of u0 in some way in order to have the story. OK, so we define the corrector matrix like that. C uh, epsilon ej is the periodized of this matrix, where the ej, ij element is just the derivative of w at j over uh, yi. Uh, where those one are related to the canonical basis and to actually uh, is simple to look that okay uh, by definition this matrix is nothing else that the matrix which is uh, obtained like that the gradient uh, uh, the matrix uh, uh, gradient w w at one gradient w at two and so on that means that the column are the gradient of W at. Okay, so it, uh, uh, we have some interesting property of those correctors. The C epsilon weakly converges to the identity field. A epsilon, C epsilon converges weakly to A0 in L2. Uh, A in L2. Okay, the proof is uh, always the same arguments. This is why it's really in the same uh, spirit of the proof uh, before. Uh, so we take the, the function w at epsilon i. Uh, this time, uh, um, the function refer to the matrix A and not to the transposed in the correctors. Eh? So pay attention on that, that here we put the at. So forget the adjoint in the, this uh, point. So as before, we can prove these convergences. Uh, here, lambda is just xj. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, by definition, uh, C epsilon ej is just the derivative of that one computed on x, so that we have the, the first property. And for the second property, we introduce the eta at epsilon e, which is the same as before, but with the at, so at everywhere, no transposed here. And again, one can prove that this one converges weakly to this one, but this one is nothing else than a epsilon, c epsilon, ej, and then we get the second convergences. Okay, I go a bit uh, quickly. Those are uh, really computation you can uh, do again uh, yourself because uh, otherwise I cannot do so much. Okay, and as before, here is important too. I can show that uh, eta at epsilon e, sa I satisfy the equation. Okay, we will use this uh, uh, these, uh, identity in the proof. Okay, so. Uh, from the previous pre uh, proposition, since C epsilon converge, converges weakly to the identity, uh, that means that uh, gradient to epsilon, gradient to epsilon minus, gradient, minus uh, uh, C epsilon gradient to u0, this is equal to gradient to u0 minus gradient, uh, gradient to epsilon minus gradient to u0, uh, plus uh, um, gradient u0 minus c epsilon gradient u0. So this one goes weakly to zero. Then uh, because the c epsilon converges to the, because this is just uh, one, okay converges to zero because this go to, okay, and then, 
And then we deduce it, uh, but uh, we know that this goes uh, weakly to zero. This implies that, no, excuse me, this goes weakly to zero also. So this one also converges to zero weakly. Okay, okay, again, uh, you, you could say, okay, what are you doing? Because we had uh, a weak convergence where there was no C epsilon, it was simpler. Now you put C epsilon and you have a weak convergence. Okay, so actually no, because uh, the aim is to prove that this convergence actually is strong. And this is the correct result. So uh, you say uh, the theorem is under the previous notation, this uh, difference <coughs> converges to zero in L1. Okay, uh, is it L1 because we have a priori just L1 because C epsilon is in L2, gradient of U0 is in L2. Then, <coughs> if uh, the product is in a better space, space, then the convergence also, also in a better space. But, uh, okay, we, I don't care here. Okay, now, the crucial lemma is the following one, um, which say, which is a technical, quite a technical lemma, but all the idea, all the proof is in this lemma, actually. Um, and um, is very interesting because uh, it showed the use of the, all the properties. So, the lemma, you know, we would like to put here uh, u uh, zero and show that this goes to zero. Okay, for the moment, what we do, um, if we can put here uh, u zero, is done because here is zero, then the limit soup is zero and we finish. But we cannot put directly like that. So for the moment, we prove that for any uh, regular function phi uh, in D of uh, omega, we have that the, the, the limit soup of gradient u epsilon minus c epsilon phi is smaller than a constant times the difference of the norm of gradient u zero minus phi. Okay, so let us do the proof. The proof is based by the, on the ellipticity. Um, so we know that by ellipticity, a epsilon times uh, this product is bigger than alpha uh, times the square of this norm. Okay, so now we develop the, the product. We have four terms, a epsilon gradient to epsilon gradient to epsilon minus a epsilon gradient to epsilon c epsilon phi minus that one plus this one. Okay, so we want to pass to the limit in all the term to show that the limit is smaller than this quantity. Okay, I'll, uh, so uh, I rewrite any time the term, so don't, don't worry because the left side is the term we want to treat. So the first one was this one, the first term. Okay, but this is the energy, so we already proved that it converges to the energy, it's done. Second term, second term was this one. Okay, so we make explicit the product, we have uh, the the product of the matrix with this vector is the sum from 1 to n of this limit. Uh, here we have phi gradient of that. Then uh, as uh, we do the same uh, game as before, I mean anytime we have a product uh, of a function by a gradient and we want to use an equation, we have to put the function inside the gradient to have the variational formulation. Then we, uh, sorry, then this one, we enter this one in the gradient like that, but now we have to remove, uh, to subtract a term, which is the term gradient of phi w at epsilon d. Okay, now here this uh, uh, product uh, weak, weak, but it doesn't matter because we can use the equation of u epsilon, so this term is nothing else than this one, and this one passed to the limit because this is strong. Here this is weak, this is strong, so everything passed to the limit. And, and we have that the limit of this is the sum of the limit. This goes to 
f phi, this one goes to xe, this one uh, also goes to xe, a epsilon gradient to epsilon go to a0 gradient to 0. So finally, we have that. And again, we uh, want to use the, equation, the limit equation. So we enter xe in the gradient. And so this is the gradient of the product minus the other term. And then uh, no, yes, no, yes, no, yes, yes, this is that. Then uh, something is strange. Excuse me. Okay, this one is equal to the, yeah, the problem is that this one is equal to that one, but that one is equal to the sum of those two ones, so we have uh, um, that the sum of those two is equal to that one. Okay, sorry. So finally, we obtain that the limit of that, um, no, I think there is something wrong here, uh, I don't know what, uh, yeah. Ah, yes, I forgot to copy this term of f. Actually, we should put this term so that term do not appear, and we only have this one, and, and then this one is just this point. Okay, sorry. Okay, for the third term, uh, we use the equation satisfied by eta at e. Uh, so we have that a epsilon, c epsilon, phi granted to epsilon, is equal to the sum of the limit of an epsilon going to zero of this quantity. Uh, now, this one is exactly eta at e. Uh, this one we write as the gradient of the product minus the other term. Then this one is zero because of the equation. Then this one is uh, equal uh, to that one. And passing to the limit, we get this one go here weekly, this strongly to u0, we pass to the limit, then now this is nothing else than a0 phi gradient u0, and so we get the third uh, term. For the last term, we use the equation satisfied by the eta at, but now we choose the product phi, phi j, w, at epsilon j, because here we have two matrices fields. Uh, so it's a little bit uh, more tricky, for just computationally more complicated, but not uh, uh, mathematically so complicated. So uh, we have epsilon, gradient, gradient, phi, phi j. Then uh, again, this is eta at, we put the, the two, the product of the two phi inside the gradient. Uh, we obtain this one minus the other term. Uh, this one again is zero because it's the equation of eta at epsilon. And this one, this converges to that, this converges to xj. Finally, we get a zero phi phi. Okay, now we collect everything. And we have, and we have that lim sup uh, for epsilon going to zero of alpha of the gradient, which is was the our uh, left term in the beginning, uh, is smaller or equal than the sum over the limit, which is this. And what is uh, I, um, absolutely fantastic is that <laughs> actually those four terms are exactly a zero gradient to zero minus phi gradient to zero minus phi. And since a zero is smaller than beta, we can uh, estimate this one uh, by a constant times the, this uh, gradient square. Okay. Actually, here a zero is constant, so okay, no problem. But even when, uh, okay, it's constant. Okay, so this is the proof. The proof. Uh, yeah, I was, uh, excuse me, I was a little bit quick saying that a zero is smaller than beta is not really exact because uh, actually the bound, uh, upper bound of a zero is beta squared of alpha, so it's a little bit uh, bigger. 
except if you define in another way, there is another way m alpha beta omega to be defined uh, using the inverse of the matrix and then you have the same limit, but okay, I prefer to use this one because it's more natural for me. Okay, so. Okay, so now uh, we have this fantastic lemma and we want to, uh, so this is the lemma, I remember you. So now we want uh, to use it to, uh, to uh, prove the results. Okay, can we, here this is in L2. Okay, uh, yes, uh, some remark is that, okay, all that is fantastic and works because we are working with L2 norms. If we are working directly in L1 norm, we can not do anything. This is why we do the proof like that. But now we are, you know, uh, stopped by the fact that we cannot put directly phi equal to zero because now then the things are not in L2. To, okay, this is not a problem for mathematicians since you know that you have density, so we can approach the norm, uh, the function phi, uh, the function u by a regular function and uh, argue by density. So this is the proof, which is now is uh, quite simpler because you, you, we use a density, a density argument, we approach the gradient of u zero in L2 by a function phi delta for a given delta. Then we have that this limit sup in L1 is smaller or equal than this one where just we add a subtract C epsilon phi delta. And we use the triangular inequality. Then now here we can make elder and we get that this one is smaller than the gradient of U epsilon minus C epsilon phi delta times the norm of C epsilon in L2, but this is a periodized matrix, so it's bounded, we don't care, we put a constant. Oops, we put a constant here, uh, a constant here times that one. Concerning the other term, Again, we put uh, uh, C epsilon, uh, we do the same things, we, we do, no. Actually, what uh, everything I have seen uh, the said is for here, here we just do elder, nothing else, but uh, we do elder with the, the measure of omega, sorry. Here and here we do elder with the C epsilon, so we get that. Now, this one is smaller than delta by approximation, and this one can be evaluated by the lemma. So finally, all that is smaller or equal than uh, C, C1, gradient of u0 minus phi delta plus uh, constant times delta. But this one is also chosen lower than delta, so everything is smaller than a constant times delta. Okay, so... Uh, but uh, so this limb soup is smaller than delta for any delta, so that means it is zero, which finished the proof. And so, okay, I stop here for the moment and I will go on in the afternoon with those.